my honor and privilege to read this very special passage to you today. It is from Luke 24, verses 13 through 35. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came and came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe that all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So we went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he walked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what that happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we are in awe of your spirit. You are present here with us today. You know us. Scripture says you know our inmost being. So Lord, we pray that this scripture, these words, the songs that we sing, that they're glorifying to you. That you center our hearts and you open our minds to the words you have for us today. That you remind us of what the disciples were doing as you began to establish your church. Lord, may this be a sacred space. In Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Spring Branch. How's everybody doing this morning? Very good. Very good. It's a beautiful day outside, so you get an extra special reward for being inside right now. So thanks for joining us this morning. My name is Kevin McGee, and uh, you can bring it all the way up here. I like standing close. <laughs> Thank you, Tyler. Uh, my name is Kevin McGee. I'm one of the elders here at Spring Branch. My, uh, though I may not look old, my son likes to remind me that I'm old. Uh, he's only 11, so I guess I'm old to him. Um, I've been, uh, been attending Spring Branch for about 25 years. I love this place. And um, we're so excited to spend the next seven weeks talking about the book of Acts, the journey into the early church, the following the movements of the disciples as they tried to figure out what does this church thing mean? And we're still dealing with that today. We're still a part of that, those roots 
of the church and what Christ was establishing with his time here on earth. Um, so join us. We're excited that, uh, that you're with us um, this morning to kick that series off. But join us for the next seven weeks. You'll have a chance to hear uh, from myself, from Kevin Johnson, um, from Melissa Davis, a good friend of ours, uh, for Mother's Day. It's going to be a very special day. Um, and uh, we've got some other folks lined up for us. So join us for the, the next seven weeks. But what I want to do now to kick off our time is take a trip down memory lane. And for this trip, it's an imaginative trip, um, I want you to close your eyes. It's, we're not going to do anything weird, don't worry, but I just want to close your eyes so that you can get some mental pictures in your head. So if you're willing, close your eyes with me for the next few moments. I want you to think back to your earliest memories of church. Being in a church, being a part of a church, maybe you grew up in church, maybe you didn't. But we all have some sort of memories. Maybe it was last week. Maybe it's this week. And maybe they're positive memories. I hope they are. That is our hope for anybody who steps into a church is that they have positive memories. But we know that for some, they're not. Maybe it is a wedding or a funeral. For some, it may be Christmas or Easter. The special occasions often etch those early memories into our brains. For some, you will remember specific, special people in your life that are there with you. Some who may no longer be with us. Are you drawing on the back of a tithing envelope? Do you hear special music? Maybe it's an old hymn or Ave Maria, Amazing Grace. Are they playing a pipe organ or a piano? Is there a beautiful choir in the background? Or maybe someone who's singing not so beautifully. Perhaps you can even smell the old pews or see the stained glass. Whatever the earliest memories are for you, do you get a sense in this moment that there's something bigger than yourself at play? That, that, that the presence of God is in that space? That the presence of God may be in this space? You can open your eyes. I don't know about you, but for me, I want to stay in that space. I want to go back to that space. For some, of this, this, for some of us, this stirs up emotion, right? Memories of past experiences. Memories with the people we love. I just want to go back to those people and experience it one more time. For me, it was Ghent United Methodist Church in downtown Norfolk. I was a sheep and my brother was a shepherd for a Christmas play. He was probably hitting me with his shepherd's crook, you know, as older brothers like to do. Um, I have very fond memories of growing up in the church. Not all of them are, but most of them. And that's our hope here at Spring Branch, as the body of believers, that everybody who walks through those doors has positive memories, has positive experiences here in this place, that their kids are learning amazing things in Promised Land and Rock City that raise up our children, as the scriptures say, raise up your children in the way they should go. They're teaching them the fundamentals, the basics of who Jesus was and what he wants with their lives. Natalie uh, just told me she, they were talking about patience up there in Rock City, and we're going to get to some of that in a bit. But I don't know about you, but I could use a little patience. And hopefully your kids are learning patience. <laughs> it's more about the patience probably we're learning for them, right? Um, this is a sacred space. Not because uh, somebody told me once that there's holiness in the walls. Not because there's holiness in the walls. But because we invite God into this space. This space has been set apart 
for the fellowship of believers, for the teaching of Jesus Christ, and for the, uh, for the devotion to prayer and worship. This should be a sacred space. So somebody said to me this past week, one of hopefully the, or maybe the last, you know, safe places we can be. We can put off what the world has, uh, has going on and we can, we can listen to what God might have for us. We can convene and commune with God and one another as the fellowship of believers. This is what uh, Luke was saying in Acts 5.42 when he says, Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stop teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Temple courts and house to house. I want that to stick in your brain through this series. Temple courts and house to house. This is why we do small groups. We have small groups starting, uh, actually I think they may have just started. Um, temple courts and house to house. This, is, this was the basics of the early church. That they were there in the public spaces in the temple. They were talking about who Jesus was, that he was the Messiah. It says they never stopped. You know, you have some of those friends who just constantly talk about Jesus all the time. You're like, oh my God. But they never stopped, right? They just kept going and going and going. And then the house to house, the small groups, if you're, not, if you're not in a small group, and small groups can look different for different people, but if you're not in a small group, if you don't have a group of people who are in your corner, who are going to be there when the tough things of life are taking place, that you're talking about who God is and, ex- and displaying that to the world together, it is a crucial component of who we are as a body. So over the next few weeks, um, coming out of Easter, coming out of the resurrection and the, the glory of the resurrection, we heard a little bit about that in Tina's, um, in Tina's passage that she read for us this morning. The transition from Jesus being here with us to Jesus no longer being present on earth and what that meant for the early disciples and what they were called to do. And then we get into the journeys of Paul and, and, um, and the work that God called him to do. And that transformation, the elders and leadership here felt it poignant. Us as a church in a bit of transition to, uh, to navigate through the early church's teachings and understanding what they were called to do. If you recall... Uh, A couple weeks ago, when I preached in February, we talked about the definition of the church. Ecclesia, as it's first used in Matthew 16, 18. I'll get to that in a sec. But the definition of the church, a gathering of citizens called out from their homes into some public places, an assembly in a Christian sense. This was the earliest definition of what the church was. And And I I do need to be reminded, we have people who join us online every week. We have a, 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 I see see the numbers every once in a while, it's 100, 100 plus people who view these messages every week. That doesn't mean they're not a part of our church. In fact, if you look further down, it says the whole body of Christians who are scattered throughout the earth. There is a global sense and a local sense of the church. There are people who can't physically be with us because they're deployed, they're in other places, they are uh, unable to physically be here, but they're still a part of who we are. So I don't, I don't want just, to um, just say it's the people in this room, although we want you to be in this room if you are able, because there's something about the human connection when we are face to face. However, it makes you none less part of the church if you're watching online or if you're somewhere else around the world and you believe in the teachings of Jesus Christ. The word ecclesia is used 23 times in the book of Acts. The most it's used throughout scripture. So we know what the book is about. We begin to understand what the teachings were of Jesus when he said in Matthew 16, 18, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Jesus himself calling Peter to this great task. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. You know, when we begin to talk about church, 
some questions come up, especially for new people. If, if you're new to church, some people didn't grow up in the church like I did or you did. If you're new to church, you've invited somebody new. Believe it or not, in our day and age, some people who have never even understood the purpose of church, they just see the Christians in the world, right? You know, people have a lot of different impressions of what the church is. I've said this before, but they say, I, I mean, I like your Jesus. I don't know about those Christians, right? I like, I like this, this person because of, of what he speaks and, and I, the miracles I hear and the amazing things and what he stood for. But people can be hypocrites or they're too judgy or they're too cliquish. And the reality is it's all true and it's not true at the same time. It's true. We can be judgy. I can be judgy. It's the reality of things. Just ask my wife. I can be judgy. I can be cliquish. I can. But I don't want to be. Paul even talks about, I do the things that I don't want to do. We live in the tension of being God's representation in the world and being fallible humans. We live in that tension, and so it's our, it's our job, it's our command, it's our call to go and be God's representation in the world and do our best. And we have grace with one another, hopefully, but we can't expect the same grace from a watching world. They don't know that grace. So we have, it's so critical for us to hold that in our hands and understand the weight of what God's calling. I mean, just... You know, if you want to really get to know me, come and hang out with me on the soccer field at the si on the sidelines when the ref makes a bad call against my team. I coach 11-year-old I coach soccer, and it's the most important thing in the world. Let me tell you about it. And it always seems the bad calls are only against my team, right? Never makes bad calls against somebody else's team. Or just sit next to me in the car when I'm in a hurry to get somewhere, and, you know, it seems like everybody else is out for a Sunday drive. You know, they ain't got nowhere to go. I don't always exude the love of Jesus the way I should. And I'm guessing you don't either. But we get to this question about what we are about. Who are we? Who are we as a church? Who are we as the global church? You have to answer the question. Jesus answered the question. Jesus gave us it in the form of a command, which we as Americans don't love commands. We live in a very individualistic society. We don't love it when somebody else is telling me what to do. Literally, yesterday, I heard somebody say, you do what you want to do, I'm going to do what I want to do, in like a public setting. It was, it was an interesting reaction. His command in John 13, 34 through 35 says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples because you love one another. Command. This is the call. This is what's laid out before us. This is who we are to be as the local church. And anytime we don't express this. Anytime we don't live this out in our daily lives, we miss the mark. We miss it because this is it. This is the grounding command, right? Love God and love one another. We got to love one another. And that is the exact reason why we are studying the scriptures in general. So we can learn how to love one another because he told us how to do it. And it's not always clear. It's not always understand. We're not always able to understand it all. His disciples certainly weren't able to understand it all at the time. They don't get it all right in the book of Acts. They make some missteps, mistakes, you know. The book of Acts, or the, the Bible in general, I mean, if you just look back through the stories that are told, like, it's story after story of somebody not getting it right. There is no expectation that we're perfect. I've heard it said in church, no perfect people allowed. <laughs> we're not going to be perfect. And we're going to need grace along the way. And we're going to need God to fill in the gaps. Because the reality is, 
we're here, we're present, we're trying to glean a few bits of understanding of who God has created us to be. Who has God made you to be? Who has God made you to be for the sake of others? It was always for the sake of others. If you look back in in, uh, Jewish history, if you look back in the uh, Holy Scriptures of the Old Testament, the blessing on um, the Jewish people was not for their sake alone. It was always for the benefit of the nation. It was always that God would bless them so that they may bless the world. That is us in the Holy Church. That is the fulfillment of the things that were promised through Jesus' resurrection. The blood of the new covenant, covenant has been poured out for you. It is, it is not, though, what you have done or what you will do. It is who are you becoming? Who are we becoming as a church? So I've done a lot of setup because I want the next seven weeks to be a dive into the Holy Scriptures. I want them to be meaningful for our church as we write the next chapter. So let's dive into the book of Acts. Let's understand it a little bit. We're going to just do the first 11 verses. And the reason I had Tina up, um, can we thank Tina for reading that scripture this morning? I love Tina. Uh, Tina and I were talking um, at our Good Friday service, or our Monday, Thursday service, and, um, and she helps lead uh, an Emmaus ministry in the area that a lot of Spring Branch uh, folks have gone through. And if you want a retreat that is really a powerful experience, Um, I I know of Emmaus, I haven't done it myself, and they're getting on me about that. But uh, my wife, or my my mother had had done that. That's a weird thing. Sorry, don't don't mix those two up. (laughs) Cut that out of the YouTube feed. All right. Anyway, um, Tina read that passage because it's such a bridge from the resurrection to the book of Acts. The resurrection leaves us in a place of wondering, okay, what next? Peter is there looking in the tomb, doesn't see Jesus. He says he goes away in amazement, in in amazement of all these things, thinking about all of these things. What next? What are we supposed to do? And that passage is so unique because it bridges the gap. You see, we get get two ascension accounts. We get an ascension account in um, in the book of Luke who is also the author of the book of Acts. Some think it was like one scroll uh, at, at one time, but it's, we, we've divided up into two separate books, the Gospel of Luke, and then he also writes the book of Acts. And he's doing this as an attest, a, a testimony to uh, Jesus' life in the early church. He's giving us an account of eyewitnesses, te- eyewitness testimony of people as they go on these missionary journeys to talk about the establishment of the church. And I love the road to Emmaus because you have this very um, dramatic scene that Jesus shows up to these two disciples who are walking along the road and has this experience. And then we come back and we later see Jesus being present, which we'll talk about a little bit again. But this road to Emmaus is this powerful moment where Jesus says, I'm not gone. I'm still with you. I'm here to help you establish the church. You see, um, you see the restoration of Peter mixed in there. There's this overlap that's really interesting that you come out of Luke with the ascension, but then you get that other ascension in Acts, and then you have the road to Emmaus, and at the end of the road to Emmaus, they talk about Peter's, uh, the, where Jesus appeared to Peter, which we just heard about last week. If you haven't heard it, go back and listen to it. The restoration of Peter, Jesus reappearing reappear, uh, to Peter. So you have this overlay, and Peter isn't actually, that restoration of Peter isn't actually recorded in the book of Luke. It's actually recorded in the book of John, which was written many years later than Luke and Acts. So you have this overlay of all of it being entwined in these events after Peter. And the the phrase I love the most about the Emmaus story is that you have um, the question, are you not the only one in this place 
that doesn't know about the events that have taken place with Jesus Christ of Nazareth? So that tells us that everybody knew what was going on with Jesus. They are, they are starting the early church in an environment where everybody knows what's going on to an extent. Everybody knows that Jesus has been crucified. He's been accused of wrongdoings. Some of them don't believe it's false, but they don't know what's about to come next. Even his disciples don't necessarily know what, what's about to come next. Let's dive into Acts 1, 1 through 15. In the first book, a lot of times I'll read through the scripture and then I'll come back and I'll talk about it in different pieces. Today I'm going to read through and talk as I go for the sake of time, and I think it's poignant to point out these things. In the first book, O oh, Theophilus, we don't entirely know who Theophilus is. There's many different um, questions about who he is. Uh, one of the um, leading thoughts is that he's a very um, prominent, um, has a lot of uh, funding to be able to give, maybe to fund Luke and, and Paul's missionary journeys. We're not entirely sure who he is, but we know that Luke is writing to him to give an account that is to be carried on beyond this uh, this experience. He says, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and to teach. So that's the gospel of Luke. Until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles who he had chosen. So he gives purpose, the gospel. And then he goes in to what's next. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. He presented himself alive. Not in a ghost form. Uh, a lot of people are like, was he a spirit? Was he hovering? I don't think so. We don't see that in the scriptures. We see him as alive. He takes fish and he eats it as like proof that he's alive, that he has truly been resurrected. And is in some sort of bodily form. Forty days. Where else do we see forty days? We see forty days in Jesus' um, journey in the wilderness. It was a time of preparation. We see forty years in the wandering in the desert. It's a time of preparation. There's some completeness. There's something going on in this time period. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, if you were raised in church, you may understand what the Holy Spirit is. But for them, I don't know what they are thinking. What is this Holy Spirit? What are you talking about? What is this going to be? But there's a, there's a true period of waiting taking place. We'll come back to that. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? What a question. What a question. There were a lot of different speculations among the disciples that were uh, wondering, what was Jesus really doing? Was he going to raise up an army that was going to fight Roman soldiers? Was he going to uh, bring his disciples? Was he going to step in as king or Caesar and his disciples would be his ruling command? That was a very physical um, component of what they thought may take place. But he was talking about something much different. He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. This is a humbling, a humbling verse. Again, in our individualistic society, we want to know. We want to know all the things. We want to know what's next. We want to know what's coming. We want to be prepared. We want, um, we want to feel like we're confident in what we're doing. But for some reason, there's a great mystery that exists, even in the waiting portions, right? 
there's something that we don't know that God is doing. We don't have all the information. And he says right here, it is not for you to know. And yet we still are living in post-resurrection church. We are a part of this with them. These are our roots. These are our earliest memories of the church. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. This is where a lot of missions uh, strategies get their roots. Is to say Judea, Samar- or Jerusalem is where they were. Judea and Samaria, the surrounding area, the region, and to the ends of the earth. Us, as a church, want to serve locally, regionally, nationally, globally. We want to carry the gospel into the ends of the earth, into our spaces, and we want to serve physical needs. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. Can you all just imagine with me, we we gloss over some of these things so often. Just standing there, watching this thing. It It was a journey of a lifetime with them. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes. Friends, it, I mean, it just keeps getting more dramatic. As they say, the hits keep coming. White robes. We're going to say these are angels. We're going to say these are God-sent beings. We're going to say these are messengers from God. They say, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. The image I get with this passage is um, these two guys. So often when we have uh, messengers from God, it's to mark uh, a moment. It's to mark something of significance. We see it at the birth of Jesus, right? We see the ho- uh, heavenly hosts come together in this, uh, uh, in this grand display of magnific- magnificence to tell the shepherds, those who are around, something has just happened. So that's what we see here. And I get this sense that it's like, um, have you ever been at work and you're all doing something? Or maybe you're just sitting around and the boss comes in and the boss is like, get to work. And everybody jumps up and they're like, they got to go. They got to do their thing. I get that sense. It's like wh- these angels are like, why are y'all still standing around? Go. Go. Go do something. Go get to work because Jesus is coming back one day and we've got work to do. But yet we're still living in the waiting period. (laughs) Don't leave. Don't leave yet. The Holy Spirit's going to come. You're going to have the power. We live in this tension always as the church of the here and not yet. There is the things that we got to do. Things that God's doing in and through us, but it's not yet complete. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room. This may have been the same upper room that they were there with Jesus, we're not sure. Where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot and Judas, the son of James. If you're counting, that's 11, not the Judas who betrayed Jesus. He is giving an orderly account. Luke is giving an orderly account. He's giving us the people who are present, who are going to lead. All these, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. 
They were of one accord. As we, um, as we talk about our early memories of the early church, that's what we get in the book of Acts. We get the early memories of the early church. We get, maybe not stained glass or those things, but we get these moments of Jesus being present with his disciples and giving them a command, giving them instructions. So I have three memories for us in the early church. One, he presented himself alive. I'm not going to take long with these. He presented himself alive. It is crucial that we know that he is alive. It's crucial, and that's why he did it. It's why he spent 40 days. It's why he appeared. It's why he showed up in such magnificent ways, was to stick those in their memory. He had many proofs and evidence. Number two, they experienced a period of waiting. You know, I talked to you, it said that Rock City, they're talking about patience up there. I needed this. I needed this uh, verse, Psalm 27, 14. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and do not lose hope. Wait for the Lord. It bookends it. It bookends it because it knows it, we know it's important. We have to wait. We have to wait. We have to not lose hope, church. Be strong. Don't you, those periods of waiting, the anxiousness, the impatience, the uncertainty, the mind games that we play with ourselves while we're waiting... We don't have all the information yet. And then they ask themselves, what next? What next? It's time to get to work. It's time to be of one accord and have devotion to prayer, to commit to the teachings of Jesus Christ, and to listen to what God might be saying to us as a church. As we close um, our service today, I wanted to take us back to one of the earliest creeds of uh, the early church. We don't know exactly when it was written, the Apostles' Creed, that I'll share here in a second, but we know that there's evidence of it where there's evidence of early creeds from even the times of disciples. We see an example in 1 Timothy 6 where Paul even says some of the things that show up in the Apostles' Creed. We think that it was derived from an old Roman creed, but we knew that early on it was an establishment of what we believed, a commitment to the basic things of the church. And so I'm going to ask us all uh, to stand. And I'm going to ask us to read this together. And this isn't something we often do at Spring Branch. We're not a highly liturgical church, but I think there's power in saying things together. And if you're new to church and you're not quite sure about that, that's okay. You could just read along. But for those who believe this to be true, for know Jesus to be their Lord and Savior, know the church to be holy and sacred, say this with us. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us sing. <laughs>